thank you, Mohamed, for the introduction and for the invitation. And I would like to thank all the organizers of this uh, conference and all the, the audience. And as uh, Mohamed said, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, hybrid AI in the sense that we are trying to combine different methods and in order to best represent uh, the knowledge we have about a problem and uh, uh, data uh, in order to solve typical example in uh, image understanding. And I will show example mostly in uh, medical uh, image understanding. So, um, when we are speaking about uh, image understanding, so there are many, de many possible definitions. So we can speak very simply of the recognition of one object or one structure. So for instance, here we have an example of, of a slice of a brain MRI. So do we want to uh, recognize, for instance, a pathological area in this region? So can, can you see my mouse? Okay, so it's a pointer here. Okay, so we can we may want just to recognize this structure, or we may want recognizing um, to recognize several structures in the brain, but also provide a more global description of what is in this uh, image in this uh, scene. Describe the spatial arrangement of object. Describe the type of tumor where it is located. What is the impact on the surrounding structures, etc. So we can, we may have very different uh, levels of, um, of descriptions. And what is important is to try to infer from the data a kind of semantics. So semantics is not directly in the images, in the data. And we have to extract it from the, from, from the image with the help of some knowledge about the, the domain and the, and the scene. And we may want to go until a verbal description of what is this image, what it represents. And then the question is, in which language do, do we want to have this description? Uh, should it be um, a formal language, like uh, in some logic, for instance, or some description in some natural language? And then which type of language? which type of vocabulary we want to use. So should it be um, dedicated to the patient, to um, a large audience, or to a very specialized um, medical expert, for instance, then of course we won't use the same language. So that's an, an open question, basically. So now, um, which are the respective roles of data and knowledge? So that's an important question. So uh, one question we may ask is, is everything is uh, in the data? So that's actually the most actual paradigm that saying that we have a lot of data and so we can rely mostly on data in order to make predictions, inference, etc. Et and indeed, there have been a lot of very powerful methods that have been developed with excellent results, in particular in computer science and uh, image understanding, uh, mostly based on deep learning uh, approaches. And that's very impressive. But there are also some limitations. So first, the access to the data uh, can be sometimes limited. And that's particularly the case where we are dealing with uh, medical images, where we may uh, have a limited um, uh, database in terms of size. For instance, when we are dealing with uh, uh, pediatric uh, data, where we don't have so many pediatric images, or when we are dealing with some kind of rare uh, pathologies, so since they are aware, there are not so many examples of, uh, of it. And uh, that contradicts in some sense the fact that um, most of these deep learning approaches need important data sets and a high number of examples uh, to train these uh, neural networks. Of course, there are some um, workarounds that can be used, for instance, using uh, uh, distillation methods or transfer learning or whatever. But still, that's a, a problem we may have. And another question is that we need the data to be annotated. And so that um, represents a high, high cost, this annotation uh, of the data. And the learning phase can be also very costly. Again, there are some solutions to cope with that, but um, that's still a problem we may have. And then another way to, um, uh, to balance these difficulties with the data 
is to exploit the knowledge we may have uh, about the domain, about the, the type of uh, uh, scene we are observing, and then use models of this, uh, of this knowledge. And this is particularly the case in uh, medical imaging, where, okay, we have images, but we also have a lot of uh, uh, knowledge that has been uh, accumulated during uh, years or centuries by medical experts. And we, uh, we can imaging to exploit this knowledge, model it in some way, in a formal model, in order to be used in some algorithm and drive the interpretation of images. And that will be the focus of, of my book. Uh, what could be this model? So that could be of very various um, uh, types. So basically, uh, it could be they could be models uh, of uh, knowledge. So about the domain, about the the way the the scene is structured, and that will be very important in the um, example I, I will present. We may have model um, about uh, about the image, so uh, how the image was acquired, which geometry, which type of noise, etc. So that all can can be modeled, and then we want to combine um, um, knowledge and image information along with the imperfections we may have. So, for instance, if we uh, think of the brain image I've shown before. Uh, we can say that so we have some knowledge that um, ventricles, for instance, are about in the middle uh, of the brain. But what does it mean so about the middle? So this is an interestingly vague description, and we, but still we can cope with that by modeling uh, this imprecision we have in the in the knowledge. And then once we have a mathematical model of all these. We, we want to insert them, to incorporate them into algorithms in order to solve very concrete uh, applications. And uh, we, may, we will have to deal with two important problems. One is the semantic gap. So when I say uh, the, um, the lateral ventricles are in the middle of the brain, they have, uh, um, for instance, a medium gray uh, dark gray level. So what does this mean? So of course, it depends on the context. When I say uh, the, the, this structure is close to another one, again, what does it mean? So uh, on, at the symbolic level, at the level of concepts, it's very clear what it, does, what it means to be close to another object. But, but when we come to concrete applications, we have to define this a little bit more uh, precisely. And obviously, being close to a, another object has not the same meaning if we are dealing with uh, histological images, with medical images, or with satellite images, for instance. So the order of magnitude will, won't be the, the same. And so that's for the, so, so we have to find a way to, to go from a concept to some concrete information in the image domain. So I will detail this a little bit more uh, later. And we have also to be able to deal with pathological cases. That means some um, observation that does not match exactly what was planned in the, in, um, in the model. So for instance, if we have a model of the anatomy, so usually pathologies are not described in, a, in the usual anatom um, anatomy descriptions. And so we have to uh, cope with differences that can be expected between a um, model that describes um, some kind of genomic cases and some very specific cases where we may have some pathology. And so this all this refers to the domain of knowledge representation and reasoning, in, in particular spatial reasoning. And again, I will come back to this uh, later. And just uh, uh, one word, I, I won't speak much about that, but uh, uh, Conversely, we could, um, we could imagine to go from images to models. So for instance, to extract knowledge, to, um, to define learning bases, to, to build some digital twins. So for instance, here uh, we have um, in these two examples, we started from medical images, segmented different structures, and then built a 3D model of the patient. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of virtual patient, and it's a kind of model uh, individual model of the of the patient that can be used, for instance, for surgery planning or, or whatever. 
So I won't have time to speak much about this direction, but that's uh, also important. Uh, now, uh, what we can expect from uh, hybrid uh, artificial intelligence is to, um, uh, to combine uh, different fields of AI, different, field, different types of methods, and uh, you, um, we can use both symbolic approaches of uh, AI and statistical or learning-based approaches of, uh, of AI. And each domain will bring its own tools for uh, knowledge representation, for modeling, and for reasoning about knowledge and data together. So for instance, we can rely on uh, logics, for instance, to, to have some kind of abstract knowledge representation and use all the um, uh, formal reasoning apparatus that comes with the logic in order to to make inference to to make um, to make decisions sorry uh, we can also rely on some structural representations in the form of graphs or hypergraphs or ontologies or uh, concept lattices in order to represent context to represent the structure of the of a scene so for instance a graph could represent a uh, concept that uh, correspond to different objects in, a, in an image and ages uh, could represent some relation between this object, whether spatial relation or uh, radiometric relations, etc. Uh, we can use a fuzzy set in order to model the imprecision we have to the way the knowledge is described or uh, the, the imprecision that, um, uh, attached to the data. And again, uh, we have to fill this semantic gap between concept and visual percepts in the image, and fuzzy sets are very useful for that. <coughs> and we can also use statistical learning, deep learning, uh, etc., uh, more on the numerical side of, uh, of AI. <coughs> And all this can um, help in spatial reasoning. So spatial reasoning, very briefly, is a domain of uh, knowledge representations uh, on uh, spatial entities and spatial relations between these entities. So that's very important. And reasoning on all, uh, on all of this. So that's very important. So now, how can we model uh, spatial entities? So we can have, um, so for instance, we have an image and we want to represent some structure. So here's the lateral ventricles that are in black here. So if we have some algorithm in order to detect these structures, to organize them from, to segment them from the images, we can use regions or fuzzy regions if we want to explicitly represent the imprecision we may have at the border of these structures, for instance. But we may want also to have some more compact representation. So for instance, describing the structure just as a bounding box, for instance, or center of gravity, or a few key points. So it's a very simplified representation. And of course, uh, all these representations do not convey the same amount of information about the structure. So for instance, if we are using uh, only the center or the bounding box, it's a very rough representation and that might be not well adapted to complex structure with a complex shape as we have here. So key points may be a little bit more informative and of course if we have the complex, complete region, it's even better, but it's uh, also more uh, heavy to manipulate. And we can also have some com um, completely abstract representation. So represent uh, abstractly a region of space as a, as a formula in some logic. And that's what is used, for instance, in a region connection calculus in order to reason about uh, topological relations about um, uh, regions of, of space in an abstract way. And of course, we can make the link with the image then. Now, um, uh, spatial relations are very important because they convey some information about the structure, the way um, objects are organized in, a, in the image. And that's very important for recognition. So, um, there are, for instance, um, uh, we can describe here the structure of the brain saying that uh, this structure here is to the left of this one, 
uh, saying that this one is um, uh, above uh, this one, so anterior actually on this uh, in this data, and that we have a, a tumor, for instance, between two uh, anatomical structures, and uh, so this is a way uh, um, neuroanatomists, for instance, will describe this uh, the objects in this um, in this image. So it's very useful to to have mathematical model of this relation in order to to guide. The, um, the interpretation of the image and even the recognition of individual structures. So this relation can be of very different nature. So for, they can be just simple binary relation to, for instance, close to, to the left, etc. They can be, uh, uh, they can involve more structure. For instance, we may have a ternary relation such as between. So for instance, when I say the tumor is between these two um, a structure, it's a ternary relation. We, we may have relationship involving a, a number of objects that is not known uh, a priori. So for instance, here it's a small part of a satellite image and we are interested in these uh, houses and in the way they are uh, aligned. Mm -hmm. So we can, um, we can detect these houses and find some kind of alignments. And of course, we don't know before how much houses will be aligned. So this is an NRE relation, but we don't know the number N. So that um, calls for more uh, complex mathematical models. And we may have some relations that are quite simple or others that are more complex that aligns, for instance, or uh, parallel. So for instance, um, in which sense is this um, line of blue houses aligned to the line of uh, orange ones, etc. And uh, of course, uh, several of these relations are not precisely defined. And then if we want to model them uh, in a, using a mathematical formula, formula, it's very useful to rely on fuzzy uh, sets to have fuzzy representation uh, of this uh, relation. And that was uh, a knowledge uh, already in the, the 70, but even if it, it was not uh, completely formalized, but uh, uh, Freeman and Kuipers, for instance, uh, already mentioned that uh, fuzzy representation are very useful. So that's we, what we did in the example I, I will show uh, later on. Uh, okay, so um, what uh, I will put, uh, present here is a way to um, model the structural information as spatial relations uh, using uh, mathematical morphology applied to, um, uh, to the two fuzzy sets. So uh, the idea is that we can model a lot of spatial relation using mathematical morphology. So this includes a set uh, theoretical relations or topological relations. Uh, distances, uh, directional relation, like uh, such as uh, to the left, to the right, etc., and as well as more complex relations such as between, along, parallel, etc. And one of the advantages of um, modeling this relation using mathematical morphology is that we can instantiate them in many different frameworks uh, as soon as we have a common um, mathematical structure of, uh, of a lattice. And of course, this applies for sets, for fuzzy sets, but also in some logics or on some graphs, etc. So that means that as soon as we have um, um, a mathematical structure, so for instance, a specific logic or graph or some graphs, and we can build a lattice structure on, uh, on them, then we can apply mathematical morphology and we can uh, instantiate spatial relation on them. So either in a complete abstract way or in a very concrete way if we are dealing with sets or fuzzy sets. So just uh, very rapidly, uh, mathematical morphology is a theory that was um, developed in the 60s and uh, uh, there was a, uh, and then in the 80 by, uh, by Jean Serra in particular, and then many others. And the main idea is to, uh, to have a, a, a lattice or a complete lattice usually, and then define uh, two basic operations that are called dilation and erosions. 
and dilation is defined abstractly as an operation that commutes with the supremum of, in the, of the lattice. So we have a partial order on the mathematical structure we are considering. From this par partial order, we derive supremum and infimum, and dilation is just defined as an operation that commutes with the supremum. And erosion is defined similarly as an operation that commutes with the infimum. So we can see from this abstract definition that as soon as we have a partial ordering on some structure and supremum and infimum, we can define these two basic mathematical morphology operators. But of course, this is not really sufficient in order to, uh, uh, to have concrete applications of, um, uh, of this uh, operation. And what is very common is to rely on um, a specific definitions that uh, involve what is called a structuring element, which is basically a relation, a binary relation between elements of the, of the lattice. So in the case of uh, sets, so for instance, in the spatial domain, a structuring element can be just a neighborhood. So saying to which extent two points are neighbors in, a, in, in the space. And then we can, uh, so if we denote by B uh, this structuring element and B um, uh, X denotes a set of points that are in relation with X. So for instance, a neighborhood of uh, point X, we can define the dilation as a degree of conjunction, uh, meaning that the dilation of a set X is a set of all points of space. So the space is denoted by S here such that uh, the, the structuring element at X, so all the points in relation with X, uh, do intersect uh, the, the initial set we want to transform. So that we, now we have a very concrete definition of that. And uh, we can understand also what is called a dilation. So we can see here on this very simple example where we have a set in a binary image, so it's the white, um, objects here and a structuring element here, which is also a set that express a, a, a neighborhood of each point and the result of dilation. So it amounts to translate um, the structuring element at every position of space and just check for this uh, intersection. And then the objects are uh, expanded and the term uh, dilation. And for erosion, we can define it using an inclusion or more generally using an implication in, in, in the underlying lattice and uh, the, the objects are shrinked and uh, the size is diminished. And of course, from these two basic operations, there are a lot of other operations. So there is, it's a very big theory and I want to go into detail of it. And in the, what, what follows, I will use mainly dilations anyway. So now um, a few words about fuzzy sets. So the, the idea of fuzzy sets that was also developed in the 60s uh, by um, uh, Lot Fizade uh, was to replace the, the, the crisp notion of uh, membership to a set by something that is more gradual. So the idea is to say that instead of having a membership which is either zero or one, so an object, uh, a point, um, does not belong to a set or belong to a set, uh, that they propose to have a gradual membership and a membership degree, uh, which is a number, uh, for instance, in, in zero one, but uh, the zero one is just a convention, it could be anything else. And so, but uh, what is important is to, um, uh, to represent this gradual um, membership to a, to a set. And then uh, Zade defined a lot of uh, operations in order to, to generalize uh, operations of, on, on sets and also on logics, uh, um, aggregation and fusion uh, methods, et cetera. So there are a lot of tools in order to, um, uh, to deal with this um, partial membership to the, with these fuzzy sets and that generalize all what we can do with sets or with, uh, with logics. So, for instance, in a, our uh, for our problem of uh, spatial reasoning and image understanding, we can imagine that an object that is not well defined uh, 
where we have some imprecision on its boundary, for instance, can be represented as a fuzzy set of in space. And then a uh, mu of x could, uh, could then um, represent the degree to which a point x of space belongs to an object, to a fuzzy object. And we will use also this, um, uh, this notion to define the degree to which a relation, a spatial relation is satisfied with respect to a reference object, for instance. So the idea is as follows. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, spatial relations are very useful in order to, um, um, to drive uh, the recognition of objects, the image uh, interpretation. And actually, these such spatial relations are very much used in um, uh, in textbooks, for instance, on uh, anatomies or in ontologies. And uh, what is interesting is that they provide a structural information that um, makes it possible to, to differentiate between objects that may have a similar shape or similar uh, appearance. So for instance, you can imagine buildings in an aerial image. Um, so they will uh, all appear as a medium gray a square in the image or rectangles. And what will, um, um, uh, what will allow to, to differentiate between this building is to know that, uh, uh, for instance, the, um, the town hall is close to uh, this uh, crossroads, for instance, etc. So we have this kind of spatial relations between objects that allows for individual recognition. And also what is interesting in particular in medical imaging is that um, these spatial relations are usually much more stable than uh, individual object properties. So for instance, if we have a pathology, so for instance, in a tumor in the brain, it can strongly deform a normal uh, structure, but the spatial relation between this structure will not be much, uh, much changed. And if we model this spatial relation using fuzzy sets, it's even more true because we gain some kind of stability uh, by modeling spatial, the imprecise, um, the imprecision related to spatial relation. And we can cope also with variability we may have from one person to another one. So um, for instance, if we consider the, um, uh, the relation to the right of, what does it mean to be to the right of? Uh, of course, we can imagine that, for instance, we have this square here. We can imagine that everything that is uh, in this um, direction is to the right of the square. But um, if we have something here, is it to the right or not? So we can expect it to be to the right, but to some degree, so, so in some sense, less than if the object is here. And at some point, we would, Say that the object is no more uh, is no, not on the on the right. So we have into uh, this um, this kind of uh, uh, graduality that is um, intrinsic to to the notion of being to the right of. And the way we, we model such relation is to define a structuring element as a fuzzy set in the spatial domain that provides the semantics of the concept to the right of. So this is represent here, represented here using gray levels. So white means uh, the, the satisfaction, the relation is completely satisfied. And um, black means the relation is not satisfied at all. So we have a degree of satisfaction of the relation of every point of the space with respect here to the center point, which is here represented as, as gray level. And then, we are uh, once we have defined the semantics of the relation, and of course this can depend on on the context. So, for instance, if we consider uh, that um, we should uh, consider to the right of to a um, to a larger extent, so we can change the shape of this structuring element. And then, um, once this is done, we can use it in order to find every region of space that satisfies the relation with respect to a referent object. So for instance, if we have this square here, we can just dilate this referent object with this structuring element representing the semantics of the relation to the right of, and we, we come up with um, a fuzzy set in space 
which uh, provides for each point of the space the degree to which it is to the right of the square. So of course we will have very high degrees here and decreasing degrees according to the semantics we have given to the concept to the right of. So that's very simple. And uh, this, had, this has been shown to have very good uh, formal properties and to be very useful in, uh, uh, in practice. And we can model a lot of relation in this way, as I mentioned before, the distances, um, uh, more complex relations uh, such as between or um, et cetera, or parallel. So again, using similar idea of using fuzzy uh, dilation. And then uh, if we have another object, for instance, this object here, and we want to know to which degree it is to the right of the reference object, we just have to put the object here and to look at the degree of, the degree of satisfaction of the relation of every point in this, uh, in this object. And then we can aggregate this degree using some aggregation function that again will depend on the application. So for instance, we can just uh, take the minimum or the maximum or the average or whatever. So there are many different aggregation functions we may want to, to have. And then we can use these uh, types of models in order to drive um, the recognition of object based on some knowledge we have uh, on the object. So for instance, uh, this was applied here. I will come back to uh, examples later on based on uh, uh, prior knowledge we have about spatial relations between uh, the objects we can see in this um, in, in this image. Okay, so now um, what do we have at this point? So we have um, different types of representations. So representation can be of ontological type such as concepts that can be modeled, for instance, in uh, some ontologies so using relations or roles or whatever for spatial relations. We can uh, have uh, graph-based uh, representations. Um, so for instance, we can have, a, as I say before, a graph or hypergraph where every vertex will represent an, an object in space. And relation will, will represent um, uh, edges will represent spatial relations between objects. So if we have only binary relations, graphs are sufficient. If we have NRE relations, so we have to move to hypergraphs. Uh, we can also express knowledge as a logical uh, knowledge base using some logic. So either um, um, proposition logic or model logic or description logics, for instance. And, um, and then uh, when, once we have this uh, um, uh, conceptual um, representation, we have to move to the information extracted uh, from the image. And again, the theory of fuzzy sets provide a very useful tool for that, which is a notion of linguistic variable which has these two levels of uh, uh, concept and then uh, representation in a concrete uh, domain. So basically that's what we did here. We have a concept to the right of, and then thanks to the fuzzy modeling, we move to the concrete sp space that, he, that is here the um, image space, but it could be a, a parametric space or whatever, depending on the type of uh, relation. And this notion of linguistic variable is very useful uh, to establish these links between concept and concrete domains. Uh, we can give another example, for instance, if we, are, we have a concept uh, web. So we are interested in web objects. So what, does, what is the meaning of web? So of course, if we are looking at the colors of uh, cars in the street, for instance, we have a notion of what is a web. And this will correspond to a given region in a color space, so that would be our concrete domain. But if we move to another application, for instance, of um, uh, I don't know, um, uh, um, uh, observation of uh, faces of uh, persons, for instance, when we say this person is uh, uh, has a red face, so maybe because the, um, the person has fa a favor uh, or something like this. 
it's not the same way, obviously, as what we think of a red car. And then this would be a slightly different region in the color space. Okay. So we have only one concept and then different concrete representations according to the domain of applications. And linguistic variables models this type of uh, relationship. And it, it allows to reason at two different levels, a conceptual level that applies to any domain, and then a more concrete uh, level, a semantic level. So basically, the first sets provide the semantics of the, of the concepts. And that depends on the domain, of course. And then so that's for representation. And then uh, we have tools for reasoning. So for instance, we can uh, try to, um, to match a graph representing the knowledge and a graph extracted from the data. Uh, we can use the graph in order to have a kind of a sequential reasoning uh, to explore progressively an image. We can express the recognition problem as a constraint satisfaction problem. We can um, express the image understanding problem as an, an abduction problem in a logical reasoning. So there are many ways of reasoning based on different types of uh, representation. Uh, coming back to this notion of linguistic uh, variable, just to give a few examples here, so I already provided the example of to the right of. So we have a concept right and the semantics, which is here represented in the image space. Uh, another example here where we have um, an example of medium distance. So that's again something, a concept. So what is medium distance? And then we can move to a concrete domain, which is, for instance, a real line, the real positive line uh, describing um, possible values of distance. And we can represent what is medium distance as a fuzzy set in this, uh, on this real line, for instance or we can represent it in the image domain uh, as well, so that we have different um, types of different possible representation. So here is um, a quite general scheme of what we can do with resources. So assume we have some knowledge, so that can be extracted. So here again, I, I take a medical example. So for instance, for brain imaging, so we have some knowledge that uh, that comes from uh, uh, brain uh, ontologies, that uh, from uh, uh, from textbooks, etc. We may have also knowledge on potential uh, pathologies, and uh, we, based on this, we can build, for instance, a graph or a hypergraph, where each structure will will be represented as a, a vertex in this graph. And we have um, a re spatial relation on the edges between uh, structures. So for instance, this uh, orange structure here, which is a collateral nucleus, is to the right of the right uh, lateral ventricle. And then we have to assess, so that's uh, again a concept. And then we have to move to the image domain. And uh, when I presented these types of representation, of course, we have some parameters involved in the, in the fuzzy set representation. And we can learn these parameters based on um, a few uh, annotated images, for, for instance. We don't need many, many for, for, for that. And then the idea is to use this uh, formal representation in order to guide the uh, image interpretation. So we can imagine, for instance, that we, can, we have a segmentation of this image into regions, and then we will build a graph from it and try to match the two, two graphs. So that's usually difficult because we, we cannot expect to have an isomorphism between the two graphs, but only a morphism because of some uh, over-segmentation uh, problems, some, uh, um, additional structures. So here we have a tumor that is not in the model, for instance. It, yeah. So that's uh, quite difficult, but there are other methods that work very well. For instance, we can decide to recognize every structure one after the other. And at each time we want to recognize a structure, we can rely on all spatial relations we have with the with structures we, that were previously segmented. So we define a kind of path in that graph. So saying, for instance, we, we tried, we, we, we start with a, a lateral ventricle, for instance, 
From that, we go, we move to the uh, caudate nucleus and we exploit the relation we have to the lateral ventricle. And then once we have these two structures, for instance, we can uh, try to segment the thalamus, for instance, where we have relations to both the lateral ventricle and the caudate uh, nucleus. And so we progressively explore the, the image. And the idea is to start with um, uh, structures that are easier to recognize and to segment and to move progressively to more and more difficult structures. Uh, another method is to uh, consider these graphs as, as a network of constraints and then use a constraint satisfaction problem in order to uh, progressively reduce the potential domains for each of the structure. So in that way, it's more a, a more global approach than the, sec the previous uh, sequential one. And it works very well as, uh, as well. And then um, once we have recognized all structure in this, we can uh, instantiate our model to make it more specific to this uh, particular case, to this uh, patient, and then try to infer a higher level description of, uh, of the image. So here are some uh, segmentation and recognition structure uh, in a few uh, examples of uh, brain uh, images using either the sequential approach or the glo uh, global one with a, a constraint satisfaction problem. And we can see that the method works very well, even if we have um, uh, pathologies, for instance, here, a big tumor that uh, strongly deforms a normal structure, but the normal structure are still well recognized. And here again, we have a, a large pathology that uh, change quite a lot the surrounding and the, the normal structures can be uh, appropriately uh, detected. So here the results are shown on uh, some uh, one slide of different patients, but of course, all this applies in 3D, which is more interesting, of course, for cerebral uh, brain imaging. So here we have a 3D uh, representation of this, um, this example here. So now, how can we use uh, this? So we can try, as I said, to infer some more uh, global um, explanation of um, some more global description of uh, uh, what is going on in the image. We can use the, the results for surgery planning, for instance, for treatment follow-up and for a lot of different um, uh, applications. So let us mention uh, higher level explanations. So that's... Um, there are many different ways to, to do that. And uh, if we want to stay in the symbolic part of AI, we can model um, image understanding as an, abduct, uh, an abductive reasoning uh, problem. So that means uh, we have a knowledge base that represents the, um, the anatomy, for instance, and we have observations, which are the images and uh, for instance, the previous result of segmentation of, and recognition of individual structure. And then we, we want to find the, the best explanation to these observations uh, according to the expert knowledge, so the, to the anatomical uh, knowledge. And then we, we have to find the right level of description, the right language, and also to find um, a description and its explanation dedicated to some explaining which can be uh, the patients, another medical expert, um, uh, any, uh, someone who do, doesn't know anything uh, to, the, to this problem. And of course, the way we represent uh, the knowledge has been to adapted to the language in which we want to find the explanation. So here is an example, so I don't have much time, but I will go very rapidly through it. Um, where the knowledge was modeled in some description logic. So we, um, we have a, a, a number of concepts that describe the anatomical knowledge. So for instance, uh, we, uh, we describe um, a normal structure, for instance, the, the gray nuclei are some brain anatomical structure, etc. We have also some description of um, uh, pathology. So for instance, uh, a brain tumor is a disease that uh, is located in the brain. And then we have different types of uh, tumors depending on the relationship uh, to uh, other uh, structures. And, uh, and then we have observation. 
uh, which would be a model as a uh, A-box in uh, description logic. So here we have uh, detected a tumor, which is a non enhanced for instance, and that um, is far from the lateral ventricle and is located in, uh, in, the, in the periphery of the cerebral hemisphere, so at the border of the cere um, cerebral hemisphere. All this can be derived from uh, the recognition of individual structure and the analysis of the spatial relation. And then from all this, what we want to have is to, to infer some explanation, gamma here, uh, that explains the, um, the observation according to the knowledge base we have. And we can add some minimality criteria. And we find, for instance, that a good uh, interpretation of this is that we have a, um, a brain tumor that is a small, um, that is a small deforming one. That means not much impact on an, um, uh, well in a pea, for instance, and that is located at the per, um, periphery of the of the brain. And of course, this depends on the explaining. So the, the persons we are uh, interested in the explanation. So just very briefly, a few other examples. So we applied the same methods to, for the recognition of this um, uh, white matter um, bundles uh, by using both uh, anatomical images and um, diffusion uh, MRI. And again, we use a description we have of these bundles with respect to anatomical structures. This was applied also to the detection of nerves in pediatric images, again, using both anatomical and um, uh, diffusion MRI with tractography results. So again, here we have a conceptual description of different types of, uh, of nerves. And then we can uh, recognize each uh, nerve bundle based on this knowledge and the data we, uh, we have. Uh, so finally, uh, I want to conclude on uh, the way we can combine knowledge representation and deep learning, so recent uh, method in, uh, in, deep, uh, in deep learning. And um, so here we have a few examples where here we model the way experts reason. So for instance, we have a, an expertise that would, may rely on many different uh, imaging modalities, but in clinical uh, practice, we don't have all these modalities and we can learn from a kind of teacher who would have all modalities in order to be able to reason on only one modality using some knowledge distillation um, uh, network. Uh, here, what we did is to uh, incorporate in, a, uh, in, a, in the networks some knowledge about the geometry of the vessel. So uh, we take into account the, the fact that we are uh, detect, we want to detect a tree light, uh, the tree light structure, and then incorporate this in the in the in the model. And uh, here it's a um, kind of transfer learning between um, uh, images of adults for uh, the pediatric images. So in the case where we don't have much uh, images, where we use um, geometrical transformation between adults and uh, children in order to segment um, uh, the here tumors uh, in a in a, so re renal tumors here in, a, in CT uh, images. And in this example, we, uh, it's, a, it's something different here. The knowledge is introduced uh, as a prior information in order to enhance the input to the neural network and improve both the detection, the accuracy of the detection and the explainability of the network. So here it was a, a, an example where we, uh, wanted to detect uh, tears in the um, uh, meniscus based on MRI images. And if we use only the, the MRI image, we have uh, um, an activation maps that uh, provides the regions of the image that co uh, contributed most to the de decision, which are not consistent. So we have, for instance, very high activation here or here, which is not relevant. 
And we use the fact that we, are, uh, we want to detect a thin and elongated structure in order to enhance the input by an additional image that is a result of a top hat, uh, um, so a very simple uh, operation. So we have now two inputs, the original image and the top hat Im image. And then we have both a better accuracy in the detection and a better activation map, which focuses more on the uh, actual region where, uh, of the, of the uh, meniscus uh, tear. So we gain both in accuracy and in uh, explainability by introducing the knowledge this time, not inside the network, but before as a, the, a modified input, enhancing input. And here is um, uh, another example on a uh, uh, wool-slide imaging where we use both the reasoning of the expert at different scales and uh, again, uh, trying to find explanations, so trying to find the region, the, the cells which contributed most to the, to the decision. So I don't have time to detail it here, but uh, we can keep it for, uh, for questions. And of course, there are still a lot of uh, open uh, questions of which methods of um, AI we want to combine. So I provided here a few examples, but this is an uh, open uh, questions. Um, to go deeper in the respective roles of data and knowledge. So uh, this uh, is also a, a question. And of course, um, about explainability. So we may want to explain uh, results, but also potential errors or methods. So that depends on the level of explainability we, we, we want. And of course, all the examples I've shown have uh, uh, been done with a lot of uh, people that have not time to, be, um, to mention all of them, but uh, they are represented here in, on, this, uh, on this map. So maybe I have to stop here to have time to, for a few questions.